Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first virtual back to class. My name is Janet Glick, and I'm the Associate Director of On-Campus Events at the Alumni Association of Mount Holyoke College. Our work at the Alumni Association is all about creating meaningful opportunities for alums to connect, so I'm really excited that this is going to become a monthly series. Registered for the webinar are more than 45 alums spanning six decades from the class of 1965 to the class of 2020. Thank you for being with us today. And for those who could not join, we'll be providing a recording after the fact. At reunion each year, we focus on providing back to class sessions for alumni to attend. We are now offering a virtual way to learn and engage with faculty on events like this one. And we'll continue to expand our offerings. If you have questions along the way, please put them in the chat box. We'll be monitoring and focusing on them throughout the presentation. It's great to be here virtually with Professor Rick Feldman, lecturer in economics and entrepreneurship and chair of the Entrepreneurship Organizations and Society Minor and the Entrepreneurship Coordinator for co-curricular events and activities. Following a blended career of business, social action and academia, Professor Feldman continues to span and integrate the arenas of industry and regional economics, startup and social enterprise entrepreneurship, education and policy development in local and global arenas. His current focus is on all aspects of entrepreneurship and social enterprise development and the roles and functions of innovation and entrepreneurial activities in development. His current course offerings reflect this range and integration by focusing on global and local challenges from which opportunities for solutions can emerge through innovation and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial and leadership. He also teaches managerial economics to introduce students to the application of economic theory in organization, business, and government decision making. Today, Professor Feldman will be discussing opportunities, entrepreneurship, and impact. Welcome, Professor Feldman. Thank you, and hello to everyone. It's quite wonderful that you're all here. I think this is the largest group I've ever attracted at the uh, back to school thing. So it, this is either a, or a, it's a combination of your interest and our new life of living virtually and engaging each online. So welcome to everyone. Of course, I have a huge amount of stuff I want to share with you. I want you to know all about the EOS program and the Nexus tracks that are also part of us. And I want you to experience what one of my classes is like. But first, I'd like to know more about you. So we have a poll set up where I'm just asking a couple basic questions to get a sense of your background and your experiences. So you'll see that there's two poll questions and I'm going to give you a couple minutes to give us a sense of who you are. And what I'm seeing is lots of participation and experience related to business and organizations, which is quite exciting. Thank you for that. It gives me a better sense of who I'm talking to. We're going to have another poll in a little bit about global issues. But before we get there, I'm going to start by giving you some background about this program. And I'm going to do that by trying to share my screen with some slides I've prepared. Okay, so what you are seeing is this Venn diagram. And it basically shows you that this minor that we've created, this is now going into its uh, fourth year, combines lots of different topics, lots of different issues. And they come together to show you that our basic focus is looking at business in the liberal arts and business in a social context. Here's, you should now be seeing a document that lists all of the 
departments and disciplines that are involved in EOS. Is that true? Entrepreneurship organization societies at the top? Yep. Yes. And you'll see the multidisciplinary aspect of this program. I'm in the economics department, but I have colleagues in all of these departments teaching courses that are part of the EOS minor. And as you can see, it's quite, a, quite an array. We have majors in our department. Uh, I should say we have students in our courses who are majoring in almost every department on campus. So this is quite an electric, electric group. This past semester I had uh, 68 students from all over campus and that's a very typical semester. Within the Entrepreneurship Organization Society complex, I tend to focus on the entrepreneurship and organization components. As I teach my courses, I try to weave in all of these other main themes and you'll experience some of that in a bit. We also have two nexus tracks that are affiliated with us, one called the Global Business Nexus, the other the Not-for-Profits Nexus. And for those of you who don't know, a nexus is also like a minor. It's an, it gives the student the ability to focus on some major aspect of something she might be interested in. So for example, she might be a computer science major but she wants to also have some focus on computer science in the global business setting, so she might take a global business nexus. Quick walk through. This is a global perspective. Here's a map of the world to sort of emphasize that fact. And why is it a global perspective? Because we actually look at entrepreneurship as it's practiced in multiple countries and how it's practiced at a global scale. And we look at some of the key influences that are happening at the global and the global scale. So for example, we know that the Northern hemisphere of the globe tends to be a heavy concentration of wealth and capital investment. And the Southern hemisphere of the globe tends to be uh, pretty much the majority of countries that are still in various stages of early development. We do research and analysis through the courses on all of these topics, government policies, economies, social and cultural attitudes, we study everything from individuals to communities, opportunities, what are the opportunities, particularly interesting question in the age of the pandemic and all that we've been suffering in the past several weeks. And we look at the local perspective, what's happening in any particular place at any particular time. These are the entrepreneurship courses. So you can see that there's kind of a flow here. Opportunities and impact focuses on identifying what are the issues that happen both at a global level, at a global level and at a local level. A whole course in analyzing those issues and figuring out how to develop solutions, which leads us to, into an entrepreneurial way of thinking, an entrepreneurship aspect, and studying the global entrepreneurship component. You'll see out here in green, there's something called environmental entrepreneurship, where we're also uh, teaching, uh, co-teaching a course. I'm co-teaching a course with a colleague in, in environmental science, where we're focusing specifically on taking entrepreneurial approaches to solving environmental crises. 
organizations and finance focuses on the next level. <clears throat> now that you've got an idea, now that you're starting to take an entrepreneurial approach, how do you create an organization? How do you finance it? What are the rules and regulations around that? We get into managerial economics where we look at applying economic theory to everyday decision making. And we end with a capstone course at, or independent study projects where students can then take an entrepreneurship project and carry it all the way forward into a launch. And we have projects at any given moment going on around the globe. And again, this perspective of all the different departments and different kinds of courses that are part of the entrepreneurship and organization program. So that's the quick overview. Now let's dive in and have you do some of the work. And the way we're gonna start is for you to think about global issues. So if you were in my course called Opportunities and Impact, the first thing you would do is break into small groups. And in your groups, you would brainstorm a list of what you think are the most important global problems that we're facing today. And the way you're going to do that now, since you don't have the opportunity to break into small discussion groups, I'll ask you to do that alone. Think about this for a second. And then I'm going to ask you to take the next poll. And you'll see that there's a list of possible things to choose from. Students, as you can imagine, come up with a much longer list. But I'm asking you to pick from this list. Imagine that you worked in your small groups and you came up with this list. And you would vote on that list. And I'm watching the vote take place and seeing what you think are the most important issues confronting the globe. So I'm seeing that inequality is a, is a hot issue. Climate change is a hot issue. Yeah, these are pretty typical. You're voting the same way our current students vote. It's very interesting. So what we would then do is talk about it in the class and we'd say, let's pick out three or four topics that we'll cover in the semester. The very first topic we're gonna to cover as a class and the next three or four topics we would do in teams. So I will then ask the class to pick of these topics that you have now voted for, let's say we're going to do climate change, inequality, and um, poor health care. Yeah, those are the top three. So let's say that we pick those top three. Now the question to you would be, so if we leave this poll up here and let you vote again, which of those three should we start with as a class? Which one would you all like to work on right now? Okay, so it looks like the one we're gonna work on right now is inequality of any kind. Now what we've practiced is this global local intersection. So globally, we know that there are severe inequalities education, gender inequalities, racial inequalities, wealth inequalities. Uh, different groups are suffering from the pandemic differently than other groups. For It goes on and on and on. So now the question would be, if you were to pick any location in the world you would like to study, where would inequality or how would inequality manifest itself in that location? So now you don't need to vote, but I'm going to have you think about this for a second. Working at home or wherever you're located, think of any place in the world. It can be a city, 
it can be a country, it can be a region, and think about how inequality is manifested in that particular location. And I'll just give you a second or two to think about that. And if you'd like, open up your chat and type in so it's, it's uh, to all participants. Type in the location that comes to mind, the particular location that you would want to work on. Now, here's what you'll do. In that location, you would identify who it is that suffers from that particular inequality, what their particular needs are, who are all the stakeholders involved in experiencing that inequality, and who are the stakeholders for whom it's to their benefit to keep things as they are? Because they're important to identify. They're going to be the they could be the barriers to solutions. So you we can close this poll and now have you type in in the chat function, at the bottom of your screen, you should all see a chat box or chat icon. Type in a location that comes to mind where you would want to analyze, assess, and come up with a solution for a particular kind of inequality. And I'll give you a few seconds to write that down. I see a few people have started to write things in. Excellent. I see India, Las Vegas, Oakland, New York City, Ghana. Great. So this is what students would do. They would then form teams around these different locations. And I purposely have students form teams of four. We learn about teams. We talk about teamwork. Why the number four and not five, not six. And we go into all the research that describes how teams are most effective in groups of four. I can share that with you real quickly. There was a really landmark study by MIT and Google uh, that really showed how, in fact, a team of four is far more effective than a team of six. And the diverse teams are more effective than non-diverse teams. So we try to form teams in the class of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different countries. And then they, in each team, they would pick one of the locations such as you have. So you're now a team of one, uh, not as effective as we'd like to have. A team of four would be better. Now you brainstorm with yourself, okay, if I were to work in this particular place, Ghana, Boston, Baltimore, New York City, Las Vegas, how does inequality show itself? And by that, we start to now analyze how do you state a problem? How do you identify what a situation is? And it usually involves being able to identify who it is that's suffering or has a need, what that particular need is, why it exists, how can we peel it back and try to get to a root cause in that particular location? And so we start to study different techniques and methods for analysis. And we use a very a range of tools such as logic models, um, problem, problem identification models, problem identification analysis. We use economic analysis, social uh, analysis, environmental analysis, try to get at who it is that's suffering, why they're suffering, what that particular issue is, and what it is that they're up against. Who's, who's stopping them from solving the problem? Why can't that problem get solved at this moment? That then takes us into the entrepreneurial thinking component, which is coming up with a solution. So now we have people working in a particular location, learning everything about that location, learning about the problem that has manifested itself there, 
understanding who's involved and what their needs are, and now trying to come up with a solution. And people brainstorm all kinds of crazy solutions, but that's the beauty of this. The beauty of this is there's no wrong or right answer, not initially. You think it through, you talk it over with your team, teams report out to each other, we have class discussions, why did you come up with that solution? What was good about it? What was bad about it? Um, how can we analyze that a little further? What are we missing? And what can be done? And that takes us into the next phase, which is the entrepreneurship and organization phase. We know that if we're going to be effective in some location, where there are people in need, we're going to need to engage them as part of the solution. They're going to be participants. So you now have to come up with a solution that might be a new organization, it might be a new product, might be a new service, but it has to involve the very people you're trying to help so that you're not doing something for anyone you're doing something with the very people who need the benefit. And we're learning a bunch of stuff here. We're learning about how do you work in a different location than your own. We learn about how do you start with the community and build from the community up. We learn about engagement. From a business perspective, we learn about how important it is to be customer focused and how to be benefit focused. People have to feel like they're part of it. They have to feel that they are actually benefiting from this new product or new service or solution. So now we start to learn some basic tools about creating a solution. And we look at different planning tools, assessment tools, we study risk, what are the risks of, six, of failure? What are the threats? So we learn about SWOT analysis. We learn about different ways of uh, assessing and measuring risk and calculating total risk. We learn about mitigating risk and managing risk. And again, each team will have come up with a solution for a location on this problem and they will create a presentation and share it with the class. We will then talk about it, dig real deep into it, because part of what we're also learning in all of my courses is how to present and how to also listen and how to give good feedback and how to help your peers get better at both the content and the analysis as well as how to present it. If students want to, they can take this project that they've worked on and they'll have worked on four in this particular course. They can carry it into other courses. They can take it into the entrepreneurship course. They can take it into managerial economics course and continue to work on it and continue to see how different leaders, different thought leaders, different entrepreneurs have tried to tackle these problems and what they've done with them. So we'll get into case studies. We'll get into how do you analyze basic decision making? What are all of the components of the value chain, for example? And how do you finance your idea. You've got a solution. How are you going to make that come to life? How are you going to implement that, both socially and economically? And then we'll look at things from a global perspective again. We'll jump back out and we'll see how different places around the world support these kinds of initiatives in problem solving. Is this a country that really helps entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs? Is it, does it have policies that are not helpful? What policies need to change? And so on. So you start to see that there's a kind of a flow 
from identifying needs, which then reveal opportunities, all the way through solution creation, solution building, and then going further with however far you want to go with developing that project into a possible actual living organization. We've had students come through this entire process and start in amazing programs around the world, everything from uh, cosmetics to fashions to uh, education to starting community-based libraries to uh, arts, using arts in school for therapy and helping um, uh, troubled children. Uh, we've got projects in Brazil, South, South Africa, um, Kenya, Ghana, I know I'm going to leave people, places out, Pakistan, India, China, uh, Vietnam, South Korea. Those are the ones that come to mind immediately. And that, I think, starts to give you a sense of how this entire program flows together and how the entrepreneurship piece is continually project-based, but also very rich with deep learning in economics, sociology, business, and uh, international development. The last thing I want to bring to your attention before I dive into some dialogue with you, this is kind of weird. I, I, the only thing I see on my screen is myself, and I wish I knew who you all were and what you're thinking at this point, so I'm going to try to find a way to uh, engage with you. The last piece I want to just bring to your attention is the co-curricular component. So in addition to teaching several courses every year and then having that whole list of courses going on around campus, there are events that are occurring in the region, events around the country, and opportunities globally that we help our students get involved in. So for the summer, we have an independent link-funded program where students can initiate a project that they will run and that, that I will mentor throughout the summer. Uh, we have eight that will be starting this summer. We had 12 last summer. We have different competitions, pitch competitions, exhibitions, uh, case competitions. We've done phenomenally well. This th Actually, for the last four years, our students have come in in first place in their division in the International Business Ethics Case Competition. We, we, are, we have coached uh, teams of four, three or four students to make presentations at an international conference. This year it was virtual and they still came in first. Uh, we've also had students win various entrepreneurship awards usually amounting to thousands of dollars to help them with their projects and their startups. We have Davis, uh, Davis Foundation for Peace. Uh, we've had a couple of students win that award in the last couple of years. Uh, that's a pretty hefty prize that helps a nonprofit uh, get off the ground in some location around the world to address specific human and community needs, community-based needs. So that's a, that's a quick overview of all of that we do. It sounds like a lot and I'm happy to go into detail in any one of those things. I wanna hear from you at this point. What are you thinking? What are your questions? And again, please use your chat function and we'll track what you write and I will respond to everything I can. How do I identify team members? I do, every one of my courses at some point or, an, or another during the course of the semester involves teamwork. 
what I've discovered is that they're really good at picking their own teams. After we do a brainstorming like you did in identifying locations, for example, you would say, I, I would like to work in, address, I'd like to address some issues in Baltimore. And somebody else would say, well, I want to address some issues in Ghana. Those people who want to work with you on that location will come to you and you'll form a team. So it turns out that students, if I give them 15, 20 minutes, they do a phenomenal job at self-organizing. And what's interesting to me is they tend not to know each other when they get into their groups. So they're quite willing to work with students they've never met before. Rick, I can read the questions to you if you'd like. Sure. That would okay, be good. So there's one that's asking um, what another common course to be taken in this program, either after or before your course. A common course in EOS? Um, it doesn't say. So I encourage students, I encourage students to take a number of courses. I, I really do encourage students to take the ethics course. I think that's really important. I encourage students to take uh, courses in sociology. The the tendency in the world has been to see business and entrepreneurship as a purely economic uh, field of study, and it and it really is not. I've actually had four successful companies that I have sold. I never I never took a single business course, but I took a lot of sociology courses, education courses. Uh, I did take some economics courses, obviously, um, but I never studied business. And, and I keep thinking that, and I don't want to say that that's a terrible thing to study, but I, I don't want it to be that focused. So I encourage students to take courses from lots of different disciplines. If they're young students, first years, sophomores, I tend to then also tell them, start by taking some introductory courses. Take intro, intro to economics, take intro to sociology, take intro to anthropology, because you'll again get a great grounding on all the things that will make sense as you go through this process. And I think if you really want to become a business leader, you'll really appreciate it later because you'll see how these things tie together. Okay, there's another question that says, this is a slightly humorous question, but not really. Does taking your course help students get jobs at places like Goldman Sachs? Uh, yes, actually, that they do. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure why that's humorous. Uh, <laughs> actually, the, among the most popular arenas right now for students who are coming through my courses uh, is to get into consulting, which, uh, which I do find humorous, but quite a number of my students go on to work for uh, McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Beacon Consulting Group, Deloitte. Uh, so my courses tend to have a, um, a component in which we do some case studies that are developed by those consulting companies so that they actually learn how to uh, respond to interview questions, <clears throat> excuse me, and know how to analyze uh, business economic questions the way in which those consulting companies would approach them. Okay, another question is, have there been any projects or ideas that have particularly surprised you? Hmm. Um, now I can't say I've been, I've been surprised. I've been really delighted uh, by some of the things that the students have come up with. So I had a student in entrepreneurship and she was a major, but her major was uh, architecture. And she came up with a, a way of constructing a one-room schoolhouse using local materials in Kenya. And we actually helped fund that through some seed funds. She got it 
planned and started. She learned that she had made a couple of mistakes. She corrected the mistakes, but she's actually built now, I think, three schoolhouses in Kenya. Uh, so that was really exciting because she combined some really interesting stuff. I just had a student graduate who won a couple entrepreneurship competitions and she was on the team that won the business ethics competition. She came up with the idea of women's um, accessories, high fashion accessories made from more environmentally sound materials and the material she discovered that she wanted to learn about and, and develop was fish leather. I guess I would say I was a little surprised. I had never heard of fish leather until she got involved in this project. Uh, and what we discovered was there actually is uh, a couple fish farms in the world that produce raw fish leather. And she is now in the process of designing and producing uh, purses, uh, belts, other accessories made out of different kinds of fish leathers. That was, that was uh, very pleasing. Okay, we have a question that's asking, could you describe in more detail some of the summer projects that you that will be underway? And then there's another question that says, asking how alums can learn about these projects and the work students do on them after this course. Okay, well, first, uh, see some of the projects for the summer that, that are being proposed and developed. One is uh, a planning project to further develop food food production and distribution in Haiti to address food insecurity among elderly in Haiti. Uh, oh my god, I'm blanking on them. Um, I, more, I can remember more from last summer. Uh, last summer was, was the one where a student developed community-based libraries throughout South Africa. So they, she would find, like a, get, wherever it was that people seemed to congregate in a particular community, it might be um, a candy store or a gas station or a hardware store, and she would work with them to then put in a community-based library there. So that was kind of exciting. Um, that's where that last summer is also where this fish leather project began. Um, we've had, oh yeah, um, a, a new startup that's going to be happening is a way to address air pollution in Lahore, Pakistan, by employing a chemical mix that breaks down, it's an organic chemical mix, breaks down very easily, it can be added to clothing detergent, making the clothing, giving the capacity to clothing to absorb certain kind of oxides from the atmosphere. So it actually can reduce um, ozone in places like Lahore. So it turns everybody into a kind of a walking um, pollution control agent. Wow. So is there a place for, for alums to be able to see where all this is, is listed and how to find out more about it? Yeah, uh, we've been struggling trying to get a newsletter off the ground. Uh, so I, here's what I would like to do. If you're interested, I'm developing a, a um, mailing list and I'm working with the Alumni Association and we would like to be able to get out to you a periodic electronic newsletter from this program that would tell you who's doing what, what are the projects, what kind of awards people have won, sort of a combination of news and updates. We got a couple out last year, this year, as you can imagine, has been disrupted quite a bit. I uh, hope we can get back to that real quickly. Okay, here's another question. Um, how are you resolving significant differences of opinion, especially political perspectives? Uh, I don't try to resolve them. I try to have them talked about. <laughs> so 
I think we do have a, a range of uh, different opinions in, in every class. It makes it very exciting. Students learn to talk about it. They learn to argue. They learn to be good critical thinkers. They learn how to express their beliefs and their, and their opinions while also learning how to listen to others. Where are there severe differences? They remain. Uh, people who are adamantly opposed to different things or adamantly in favor of certain things, uh, then I don't ever try to say that it has to go in one way or the other. What I do insist on is people use good argument. They learn how to structure an argument. They learn how to use good evidence. They learn how to support the arguments with information. Um, they, and they learn how to talk with each other. Okay, and um, one person was asked after you explained um, how yeah. we could find out more about what the students are doing. The question was, um, do they, um, after, do they share their summer internships in a, in a greater group after they're over? Is there a place that that, that happens? Yes, uh, that's, so that's one of our requirements. So everybody who gets particularly this link funding, but everybody who, who does a summer internship typically comes back to campus and shares it. So in the fall, there's something called the LEAP Symposium. And that's, uh, a, I don't know, a couple hundred presentations. Um, so we dedicate an entire day and faculty help moderate link panels and the panels are students of four or five people sometimes six people each student gives a 15 minute presentation and there's discussion and we invite alum participation in that would love to have alum show up uh, and then we do it another version of that is in the spring we do senior uh, senior symposium where seniors present their their projects and that includes some of these and as well as senior theses. Okay. Wonderful, we have one last question. Um, what percentage of the, of the projects are nonprofit versus for-profit? Hmm. I think there's a slight edge to the nonprofit side, but we have, I'd say it's like 55, 45. <laughs> Uh, so it's almost even, but I think there might be a slight edge to the nonprofit approach. And how are we doing? Is that we're we good? Are, we're, we're, we're good. Um, we are just about out of time. So I wanted to thank you for being on our webinar today and talking to us about um, your wonderful uh, class. Um, and it's really exciting to see um, how students are making a difference in the world. So thank you so much. And I want to thank all the participants or attendees that are on. Um, I hope you got something out of this. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to let us know afterwards. Um, we are, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a monthly series on these virtual back to classes. And next month is on June 19th. And we'll be hearing from visiting lecturer Jason Young. He's going to be talking with us about searching for dark matter in the darkest galaxies. To that, we just want to say thank you. And if you have anything final that you'd like to say, Professor Feldman? No, I thank everybody for attending. And I really look forward to staying in touch with you. I, I, I will work very closely with the Alumni Association. We do have a new um, database tool coming online sometime soon that will actually elevate uh, capacity for alumni and students to engage with each other. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and I wish you all well. Stay safe, stay healthy, and a speedy recovery to the world. So thank you. All right. Thank you.